Welcome to the TA Leader Series, the series where we talk to people that we think are doing innovative and strategic work that is really making a difference in the industry. Today, I'm thrilled to have Steve White with us. Um, Steve is at BECU, heading up talent acquisition. But Steve, let me let you introduce yourself to the audience, please. Yeah, hi, Mark. Thank you so much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Steve White. Um, I lead talent acquisition for, uh, for BECU. BECU is one of the largest credit unions in the country. Uh, we have about 1.4 mem million members and about $30 billion in managed assets. So uh, it's it's uh, a credit union, but probably not the credit union you, you may be normally accustomed to or used to, like the neighborhood credit unions that that you're familiar with. You get the same feel and, uh, and you know, um, a connection with uh, with one of our neighborhood financial centers, but but we're a bit larger. Uh, I've been in the talent acquisition space for almost two decades. I've worked in organizations like um, you know the the uh, Pier One Imports, which is no longer uh, in existence, but still near and dear to, to my heart. Um, FedEx supply chain, um, and then the one that I, I always talk about, of course, being here at BECU, but I spent some time at Lockheed Martin that that forever changed my 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 life, leadership, and thinking, um, and so really proud of that time um, at, at, at Lockheed and spent a little bit of time at Microsoft as well. So been in places where, you know, we had high, high, high hiring volume, <laughs> try to get that out, high hiring volume. And then uh, where we've, you know, uh, you know, large, complex organizations where, you know, talent acquisition did, you know, drive a lot of results. And really, I mean, one of the things that I saw when I was at Microsoft was, you know, um, uh, an acknowledgement of how talent acquisition changed the business, right, and mm -hmm. impacted wow. business results. And for uh, a CFO to say that on an earnings call. Right. And that happened during my time at Microsoft. That that was a really, pow really powerful experience um, and just just helped to continue to shape my thinking. So kudos to the leadership at, at Microsoft for really driving that change and really um, putting talent acquisition in a space where we have that seat at the table. Right. That everyone, uh, you know, so, so strongly craves and desires. Right. And I mean, bravo to Microsoft. But one of the things that I saw during COVID when particularly coming out of COVID when you know organizations weren't well staffed, we had one client that was retail, and they couldn't reopen their retail stores because they didn't have the staff. And all of a sudden, you know, managed CEOs went, "Wait, you mean I I can't hit my numbers because I haven't got the people in place to do it?" Um, it it changed the dynamic. So yeah. you know, COVID was horrific for lots of people, but it it yeah. there were some things that came out of it. But I, but I love the the variety of industries that you've been in as well. I mean, not only very different organizations with different cultures, but different industries and so forth. But let me ask you now, just to sort of set the stage at, at BECU in general, we're seeing a lot of change in the marketplace. We're seeing a softening of the market. There are more candidates than there were. We're seeing AI that candidates are using, that the right. business is using. We're seeing this whole tension between return to work versus remote and so forth. Well, how's that impacting you? What are you seeing from your perspective and the, the kinds of folks that you're trying to hire? What What's changed yeah, you know what? It's, it's quite interesting because we, we just had a, a meeting with one of our, our vendors um, recently, actually LinkedIn, right? And we were talking about the application volume, things like that. And our, our application volume continues to to increase, even though our, our uh, position volume has gone down. And, and I, I find that to be interesting because, um, you know, it not not so much that, you know, people are still applying for jobs and those sorts of things, but when we're proactively searching in the market, People are are less likely to uh, to make changes, right? We've heard of the big stay right after the Great Resignation, and so yeah. there's there's certainly less um, people who are willing to make you know make the leap from one one employer to the next. But we're still seeing this high application volume, and then there's the the conversation about how low unemployment is, right? So um, seeing some of those things is is just an interesting dichotomy, in my opinion, of of how you know how confusing uh, at times the market can be. Um, but one of the things, I mean, we, we're, we're seeing uh, from, a, as you mentioned, AI uh, is really where I want to kind of bake in right now is, is, um, is, uh, you know, some of the, the, the questions that people are being asked in an interview or even technical space, right. And people utilizing AI to be able to answer questions, right. In, in a technical interview. And John Vlastalika wrote an article uh, not too long ago about how we should change. And I was in a meeting with him one day and he mentioned this too. We need to change our perspective on cheating, 
right? And in the interview process. And so what does that mean and redefine what cheating is? Like is, is you know, using Google or, you know, chat GPT, uh, something that we should think about or consider to be cheating anymore? Uh, or is it uh, an innovative or 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 a, a great way to, to help you solve a problem? Uh, do, we, do you uh, really want to screen out everybody who uses the available tools? I mean, right. you're crazy. Exactly. If you're technically sophisticated, we don't want you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so we had that conversation recently, right? Because we had a leader right. say, well, I believe they're using chat GPT to help them answer the questions. And I, I, I said, well, you know, I have my, my, my daughter-in-law who's majoring in, in software development in, in college. Uh, she had um, a, a situation where she was, you know, taking a coding test to try and, you know, get an internship. And she's going through this coding test. And she told me, she said, it took me two hours to answer one of the questions. And so, and much of that is because she didn't have the knowledge and experience, right, to be able to answer that question uh, very well. And she's trying to gain that knowledge and trying to get that experience, but she didn't have it. So you've got uh, an experienced software dev who may be on a call and they have to look up some information. And if it takes them two hours to answer the question, it may be a totally different situation. But they're answering that question within the time frame that's expected and allotted. And so it's 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 not an issue. It is like you mentioned, Mari. I mean, they're utilizing the technology available to them to be able to get answers as quickly as possible. If an individual sitting at their desk at work are we policing what they're using to, to, to try and complete their work? Like, can they not utilize Google to complete their work? Can they not, can they not ask their peer a question to be able to get those things done? So I, I just, I think, you know, we expect people to perform in an interview uh, perfectly and leaders, you know, I'm hoping to help some leaders in our organization change their perspective around that. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a steep hill to climb, but I'm um, hoping to get there. And, and we hope from the candidate perspective that companies can be transparent about what's acceptable to them. Right. You know, for the candidate, are they cheating? Is this going to disqualify them? Is this expected of them? Um, it, there's a lot of gray area right now. And to the extent that we've seen a couple of organizations, you know, that have come out and say, here's, you know, what we expect from you, if you use AI for this, that's perfectly fine. What we don't expect you to use AI for is this. Right. Um, we want your authentic voice, but we want your best possible, you know, presentation of your authentic voice um, to really help candidates so they know. You don't want to Absolutely. unfairly, you know, disadvantage people who want to use it but are think it's ethical. Um, it, it's going to be an interesting, <laughs> right. an interesting journey. We live in interesting times once again. Right. Um, we really, so, we really do. It's it's yeah. very interesting. We'll see what ends up happening. I mean, and and I think. Um, like oftentimes we put people through an interview process and some people in the technical space, I've seen it probably more than, than any other, but there are some spaces, right. Where that exists, where people feel like they have to put a candidate through like a hazing sort of process, yeah. right. In order for them to get the job. And, uh, and it may have been an experience that they had gone through. So now they feel like they have to, you know, put someone else through this rite of passage in order for them to, to come into the organization. And we, we have to change our perspective around that. And really, we're trying to help. We're, we're going through some hiring leader interview training and interview training within the organization that we're building. And a large part of that is, is helping hiring leaders to understand and interviewers to understand that the person's simple, simple principles so is not earth shattering. But the person's interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing them, right? And so, you know, understand that. And I just think it's it's not something that has clicked in the minds of many interviewers quite yet. Like we feel like we have the the upper hand um, in those conversations that we have to to really understand that 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 this is a that we need a balanced perspective going into those conversations. So yeah, I mean, all of our clients are large enterprises and and all of them prestigious organizations, and it's it's nice to see the pride in your organization of this is a top-notch organization. It's right. a privilege to work here. Right. But there's a balance there of right. top-notch candidates have options of 500 Fortune 500. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. you and 499 others. So um, <laughs> applaud the, the positive Absolutely. culture, um, but you do need to put it in perspective. Um, Absolutely. So important. Absolutely. <laughs> How has all this changed your leadership approach? What I, I know you you're, you're strong on the leadership and understand that that's the make it or break it. Huh? What's that look like day to day for you? Yeah, so so for me, I mean, I I, I try to focus on um, you know really driving culture, 
right? Uh, culture is a big, a big thing for, for us. So just, and I, I define, I think about culture from the standpoint of like, what's in our minds, right? How are we thinking about, you know, the work we do, how we show up at work every day, and then how are we acting upon that work? Um, and so, you know, and, and doing that as a collective unit. So seeing that across the board and some consistency within that, that, uh, within those areas. And so one of the things that, that we've done here, uh, which is a shift for the organization here is, you know, create some repeatable purposeful measurable results. And so we've, we've gone through, uh, from a TA leadership perspective, gone through lead in 30, which is a, a leadership, uh, program um led by an org- phenomenal organization and so we um we've gone through that and and it's helped us to really understand that that we need to create clarity build alignment and generate movement for our team in order for our team to really be able to drive success and so at BECU from a talent acquisition perspective we say that you know our vision is we catalyze the growth and transformation at BECU um, I've said this before, I'll keep saying until I'm blue in the face and then I'll say it some more um, that, you know, if, if people are the greatest asset in any organization, then then talent acquisition is on the forefront of creating that, making that organization better. Right. Yeah. So we have a responsibility for really driving results within an organization and making that org better. So if we do our jobs really, really well, the org is going to do well. Right. If we do our jobs poorly. Uh, the organization will probably follow suit, right? And so uh, our goal as a team is to really drive success. And so we've got uh, four priorities this year. The first one is talent acquisition excellence. It's a focus on driving excellence. And we have four culture beliefs that, you know, uh, and one of them is drive excellence. The, The four of them are always improve, own it, growth mindset and drive excellence and drive excellence mm-hmm. is a focus on not perfection right uh, or some mm-hmm. people hear excellence they start to get nervous but the drive <laughs> excellence key for us is i'm committed to achieving the best right mm-hmm. the best results and then raising the bar in my work um, on a daily basis that's what drive excellence means to us and so when we open every meeting as a team we're providing recogni- recognition for one another, and we're using those culture beliefs, right, to to recognize a team member within talent acquisition. And it's not, you know, hey, you showed up to work today. That's what you know. <laughs> like, no, it's it's you know, thinking about like how that's raising the bar. Like, what did you do to raise the bar in the work and in what we do? And so we've worked to to change the perception of talent acquisition, the ones that people may have come in from other organizations with, the ones that, you know, people may have developed while they're in this organization to really help them understand that TA is a a valuable function within this organization. And so, you know, we're, we're, you know, not wanting to engage, not wanting to engage in the duties and responsibilities, or even at my level with the, like having executive conversations with, you know, executive leaders about what's your headcount plan going to be this year? It's much deeper than that, right? The focus is more so on, you know, what are you planning to do? Like, what's your business? What are your business goals? What are your, your what's your two to three year outlook? What are you focused on here? So then we know how to set our talent acquisition strategy, how to set that requisition or that job strategy to whatever that leader is planning to do, those objectives and key results for that particular individual or role, you know, the projects that that individual individual is going to be working on more so than just going through the list of job duties and the qualifications on that role, right? So really focusing more so uh, strategically and then driving the, 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 um, the culture. So I mentioned that, you know, talent acquisition, excellence, uh, talent intelligence, um, talent engagement, and then candidate experience are our four priorities this year. So uh, talent acquisition excellence is really creating an excellent culture within talent acquisition, focusing on how do we drive excellence? How do we create excellence? And then how do we operate with excellence on a daily basis within our group, within this organization? So that is, you know, um, you know, a great focus on being talent advisors, having a strategic and planful approach, and then integrating ourselves deeply and embedding ourselves into the business. And then talent intelligence focuses on predictive analytics, right? So us really understanding, you know, not just what's in front of us or lag measures, we want to drive lead measures and then understand, you know, the outcomes well before they happen, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and the talent engagement piece of sourcing and, you know, cutting edge sourcing and pipeline. And we've got, you know, Marvin Smith leads our sourcing organization yeah. here. And Marvin's done a phenomenal job of bringing in perspectives of sourcing and, and just mm-hmm. different ways of considering it. Our sourcers participate in every recruitment strategy conversation we have with the leader. We don't call them intake meetings. I, I, intake meetings are, I, I loathe the term. I, it makes me <laughs> think about my kids would get sick and we take them to the ER and then the <laughs> person you see in that conversation is an intake counselor, right? That right. person isn't there to help you with your issue. They're there to see if you can pay for the visit, right? <laughs> that's, that's, not, <laughs> right. that's not us, right? We're the doctors right. and the nurses understanding the issue and then prescribing a solution to the problem. That's our focus and that's what we need to be driving toward. And so that's why we focus on recruitment strategy versus intake. And so, and then recruitment marketing, which you and I had talked about earlier, recruitment marketing, employment branding is such a key for us in 2024. And so we're driving toward that. And then candidate experience, right? And we, 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 uh, we, we need to focus more on, you know, enhanced engagement with our candidates, improving, you know, uh, our messaging and then additional strategies related to, you know, follow-ons, right? After an individual's onboarded, you know, connecting with them, the recruiter, connecting with them day one, day 30, day 60, day 90, beyond, creating a one-year experience for the individual. I use an Uber example with the team on a regular basis. I take a lot of Ubers, but I've never had the same Uber, Uber driver twice. Um, so that's an interesting, you know, the, the, you know, the algorithms or whatever we want to call it within the Uber app never connects me with the same person twice and not right. because even if you give them a five star rating, right. Right. That, right. It, yeah. Yeah. it just doesn't happen. And so yeah. we as recruiters are sometimes like the Uber app, right? We're dropping <laughs> our candidates off and yeah. then we never see we us. Again. It's just never a great experience, right? We want to make sure that, that they trusted us enough to bring them through the process, to, to, to say, yes, I'm, I'm saying yes to the job here. And I'm, I'm putting my employment, my, my future, my, my, uh, my livelihood in your hands, essentially. And then we drop them off and we never see them again. And that's not okay. So we're really pulling that thread through uh, the first year to really focus on, you know, how do we make sure that they're engaged because, you know, a great candidate experience leads to a great employee experience. Yeah, the, the, the thing that I, I love about the theme underlying all of this is, and you touch on the fact that you're sitting down with business leaders and asking them where the business going, it tells you where to make investments. It tells yes. you what kind of messaging you need to have out there. It gives you direction and focus. And that's so key. It, it's not the reactive, oh, I've got you know X number of open recs right now. It's you're building something. And, right. you know, bravo, it's, I wish I could tell you, I oh, I hear this all the time. I don't hear this all the time. So I'm like thrilled when I, I hear it back. So um, Shiv, I want to be conscious of your time because I know you've got a big meeting later today. Um, and I sit here and talk to you all day if you let me. I um, but I will I will wrap this and thank you very much. Um, appreciate this. We will, we will come back to you. You can trust that. You will be a guest again because we want to hear the follow-up and, you know, where you're going and how the progress is going and, when your goal is to get better at it every day, um, you know, that's, that's really powerful. So thank yeah. you. And we'll be back to you. Oh, thank you, Maury. I really appreciate the time. And you said something that I mentioned to the team yesterday, getting better every day. We use Nick Saban, the legendary college football coach, as an example in the process that he implemented at the University of Alabama, taking them to be perennial national champions and uh, a perennial powerhouse in that space. And, and, you know, one of the things he talked about in the process was, not focusing so much on outcomes, but really focusing on the small steps that you take every day to get better. So I'll get you there. Great. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Thank you.